So somewhere, somehow, I know people are going to take this wrong. Um, I didn't sleep much last night. Um, I think when I was driving down the road, you know, I thought of something. That there's two times that I ask God to do something and two times he's done it. I'm not a hundred. I'm not a hundred percent sure if it happened again, but someone posted up a scripture to me earlier today, talking about um, the Holy Spirit, and what this person posted up was this scripture right here, and. With me looking at the ESV version versus uh, versus uh, the King James or other Bible versions, it's not wor word for word the same. But there were three words that were listed there. Uh, I wish I had written down written down before I started this video, and. Uh, If you looked at those three words, it was not a hundred percent that what you read is what you were going to get. And this person did not write down all the scriptures. This person wrote down two scriptures. I saw three words and I was like, you need to go back and you need to look at those words these three words right here. But again, in the ESV, it's not the same as the Bible version that this person sent me. And um, then when I went back and I opened up this Bible right here, and I went back and I, I made a video earlier, and I was reading from the Bible these scriptures and something cross my mind that it's a condition and I know it's a condition I really shouldn't have deleted the video because I think it was a good video but I don't think it's going to make a difference because the two videos that I made today only three people I had three what I had three views so it's not going to make a difference because at the end of the day I'm not going to get no views on the video, and I really shouldn't have to title it out a certain way for people to watch the video. If somebody liked the video, um, then, uh, then they should share it, correct? It's in the book of John. I thought it was in the book of Romans. I was wrong. It's in the book of John. So, um, I want you to see how this scripture is right here. And listen to what it says. This person posted this up to me because this person did not believe you could lose the Holy Spirit. Now, listen to the way it's phrased. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Okay? So this is the reason why this person posted the, this comment to me. Was because of that right there, as if this person was referring to, you could not lose the Holy Spirit once you got the Holy Spirit. But that's not the case. I'm going to say it over again. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. Okay? So this person posted this to me as if they were referring to this scripture as saying you could not lose the Holy Spirit. Now... 
let's go and read what it says before that. Because this, in my Bible, is where it says Jesus, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. Is this a condition? And I really do think it is. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father. So, it sounds like to me that if you do what he asks, then he will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. Because if you love me, so you clearly have heard scriptures in the Bible referring to the love and what it proves, what it takes to show that you love God and Jesus. You get that in the Bible. But if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. So isn't it weird that the other day I was reading a whole bunch of scriptures in a video that I uploaded. And I, I, I know I read these scriptures off. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. So why is it so important that we're supposed to keep the commandment, which I do not know what it's referring to. You may say the Ten Commandments, and I may say that that may not be what it is, but I'll give you benefit of the doubt. I mean, we know we got laws, uh, laws statutes, and commandments. But why would it say this? If anyone loves me, so this is referring to loving me again. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I'm going to tell you this right now. I think the proof of someone loving Jesus and loving God is by keeping the word of God. The whole entire word of God. Because there's still a reason why you have to be a doer of the word. It's like what you read here in God's word, you incorporate it in your life. And it makes all the difference in the world. That if you read the Bible, you incorporate it into your life and it makes all the difference in the world. But I was looking up another scripture earlier, Romans 15, 18. And I'm going to have to go back and I'm going to have to look at something I just found before I started making this video. Romans. I know it's right here. Why I'm not seeing it, I don't know. Oh. Oh. It's before John, that's why. I don't know why I didn't know that, because I just saw it a second ago. I don't even understand what's going on in my head. Okay, Romans fifteen eighteen. <clears throat> For I will venture to speak of everything of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. To bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. 
Well, you got good deeds in the Bible and you got bad deeds. I looked up earlier what the definition of deed was. But why does it say that Paul is... His message is to bring the Gentiles to obedience. Paul is not boasting about himself, but glorifying in what Christ has accomplished through him. He characterizes his ministry to the Gentiles as being by word and deed. Paul's impact on people was not just intellectual, though that was form formidable. His life made an impact as a living letter illustrating the resurrection reality of Jesus. Um, now, I saw something here, and I'm going to go back and I'm going to read it. But I'm going to tell you this right now. It is about the Word. Now, I'm not saying I'm rightly dividing all this, except for what I read a minute ago, because I know right now, if no one's going to keep the commandments of Christ, they're not going to have the Holy Spirit. I know they're not. You know, isn't it weird that, again, there's a scripture that says that God gives those to the Holy Spirit to obey Him. And there's another, there's another scripture that people have said that they thought it that they that they quoted it as a scripture, but I've went and looked and I cannot find it anywhere referring to believing. And if you believe that you receive the Holy Spirit, there is a scripture that I know that I've read that, that I've seen that says, "Now that you believe, have you received the Holy Spirit?" But again, I'm still going to say that God expects people to be obedient. And that's a fact. And uh, I still believe that believe is obe and obey are somehow tied together. So, right here I read something. Crucifixion was personal, focused on an individual. Me, we must put to death the deeds of our own flesh by walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Killing the deeds of the flesh. The Roman sentence of crucifixion lends insight into the nature of how we must put to death the deeds of the flesh. See what else it says. Crucifixion was painful. We fool ourselves if we think the habits and desires of the flesh will die without a struggle. That's right. The struggle that Paul was talking about was not giving into flesh. Crucifixion was pitiless. pitiless. There was no turning back once a process began. Victims of crucifica crucifixion were not just removed from the cross until they were dead. We must be just as merciless in putting to death the deeds of our flesh. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that the reason why Paul was no longer a child of wrath is because he crucified the flesh daily. and he I mean, he crucified the flesh and died to himself daily. People, you can believe all you want. Um, Romans 8. This is where Romans 8, 9 is. Life in the Spirit. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But you got to remember again, for you to have Christ, you have to have the Holy Spirit. Because that's what Romans 8, 9 says. So, therefore, I mean, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ, Jesus. So, first you must have the Holy Spirit to, to, for that to work. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you 
free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sin, full flesh, and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, might be fulfilled in us, who walk according to the flesh, but but walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You can't be led by the flesh. You have to be led by the Spirit. Don't you think Christians out there ought to wake up to that? For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the, on the things of the Spirit. So those that are living for the flesh go out and do sinful things. Those that are living for Christ that are led by the Spirit do Christ-like things. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, I know that's Romans 8, 8. I already knew that. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Well, evidently, this is saying there's a reason why you are not of the flesh, but in the spirit. So there's something somebody's done. It isn't simply believed. There had to have been something here. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. That's a different version you know, the, uh, the King James says, not of him. If you do not have the Holy Spirit, you're not of him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit of, is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. But it still does not nowhere there claim that you cannot not lose the Holy Spirit. Neither did that scripture that I read a minute ago. Again, you can clearly see that this is someone out here that is not living for the flesh. This is clearly someone out here living by the Spirit. And how would you live by the Spirit? Well, I mean, you could. there's all kinds of numerous ways that you could say that you would be led by the Spirit. But clearly one of them is that there is absolutely, and I'm going to say this, and I'm not standing, I'm not stepping over my boundary. There is no way that God or Jesus could ever deny anyone that is a doer of the word. So from what this Bible says from the beginning to the end, if you're a doer of the word, I don't want to give no examples. You, I think you can figure that out on your own. You cannot get denied. But if you don't want to be a doer of the word, then you can be deceived. In the flesh means an absolute inability to please God. Only surrender to the Holy Spirit can guarantee motives pleasing to Him because the human heart is deceitful and wicked. <clears throat> I'm going to read from what it says before then. Romans 8 rings with victory. It begins with no condemnation and ends with no separation. In between there is no defeat. I'm still saying that there's nowhere there that says 
that if you go back to living for the flesh after you're led by the Spirit, which is clearly what a person does when they backslide, go apostate and fall away, is to do the things of the flesh. Remember, sin, sin comes from the flesh and the sight, so your sin comes from your flesh. So, as you go back out and do sinful things, that's going to be the flesh. You got evidence from the flesh right in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Ephesians and Galatians. Gives you example. And what is the example of the flesh? Sin. Paul summarized not just chapter 7, but the entire argument up to this point, especially 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now contrast that peace with the time before people enjoyed eman em emancipation from sin through Christ's justification. The believer's judgment is behind them as the cross of Calvary. The unbeliever's judgment day is ahead of them. But then, here we go. Here we go. Now we're going to talk about unbelievers. What is an unbeliever? That's a disobedient person. I am telling you right now, in the word of God, there is a message of obedience. People are never going to like that I ever say that because at the end of the day, I'm going to say that you have to be obedient to remain saved. You have to stay repentive to stay saved. Yes, you do. And 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 I'll and I'll use it the way I was thinking about it a minute ago. Like I said, these things are not saving you, but are you going to be saved without them? Well, clearly not because if you're going to go back to living for the flesh, after you've been led by the Spirit, or if you've never stepped away from living for the flesh, then you're going to die. There is no peace and life living for the flesh. And only Satan is the one out here that wants people to be the same way they were before they gave their lives to Christ. And there are clearly a lot of Christians out here that are no different than the way they were before they supposedly gave their life to Christ. The ones that did. I mean, we were living for the flesh. Just because you're not doing all the things that you've done in your life doesn't mean that if you just did half of them, you'd be the same person. So what? That's no different than when I smoked weed when I was 14. I hadn't taken any pills. I hadn't done no crank at that time. Uh, I hadn't done a lot of things. Just because you cut back on these things doesn't mean you're going to be right with God because you would clearly have to get rid of all this stuff out of your life. And I'm not going to sit here and say that you're never not going to do one of these things again. But if you clearly stay on that path, then there's no salvation. There's clearly no salvation because there's no doubt. There's no doubt. Why would be why would drunkenness keep someone out of the kingdom? You want me to tell you why I think drunkenness would keep someone out of the kingdom? Is because if we were supposed to deny self, die to self, fight the temptation, crucify the flesh, and forsake our ways, then that would mean that we had a choice to make to make the right decision not to do the things of the world <clears throat> and when we're getting drunk uh we're clearly doing things of the world are you going to go to hell for fornicating or are you gonna are are you gonna are you gonna go to hell for fornicating one time, or or to keep on the fornication? It could be both. 
but I could get drunk and not necessarily be considered drunk in this. I could get drunk tomorrow and never get drunk again. Is that considered drunkenness? But there's clearly a reason why we wouldn't be doing it. And it's only because of what the word of God says. And I think that that's why it's relevant to be obedient. Because if God doesn't want us to be, if he wants us to be clear minded and not to be drunk, not to make the mistakes that so many people have done while they've been drunk in their life, could even cost people their lives, friendships, families, the whole works. It's no different. I told someone the other day it was the same with marijuana. Just because I could get high and may not go out and do something, somebody else could. You know, I get drunk out here. I'm not a person that beats someone. I'm not someone that goes out looking for a fight. I don't even think that unless a cop or somebody was doing something to me, that I would ever be mean to a cop if I got pulled over for drinking and driving. But look how many people out here do things that they normally wouldn't do if they weren't drunk, and they do when they're drunk. That's the reason why. There may not be a man out here that would ever touch his wife, child, family member at all if they weren't drinking.